like Judge Wood, I'm going to talk about the judiciary, but I'm going to focus specifically on the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, my own view is that uh, the Supreme Court is an extraordinary institution that plays a fundamental role in the American constitutional system. Um, I've spent my entire career thinking about writing about uh, the Supreme Court and about the Constitution and about constitutional law, and so I have a lot invested in feeling good about this institution. And I have to tell you, I do not feel good about this institution today. Now, both, both Leslie Berlowitz and, and, and Judge Wood mentioned uh, that the public opinion of the Supreme Court in recent decades has uh, plummeted. And it's interesting to speculate a bit about why that might be so. Um, during the Warren Court era, uh, the public view of the Supreme Court was undoubtedly uh, pretty low, uh, although there weren't polls of the same sort that we have today. Um, and that was largely because the court was deciding cases that uh, members of the majority uh, generally did not particularly like, um, because many of their decisions were telling the majority they couldn't do things that they would like to do, like discriminate against African Americans or, or uh, malapportioned legislatures and so on. Um, but that explanation doesn't really hold true today, although the current court occasionally makes decisions that are unpopular, like Citizens United, um, for the most part, that's not the source of the, of the public um, disillusionment with, with the Supreme Court. Um, rather, that disillusionment, I think, stems from a, a, a sense of the court being highly polarized and highly politicized as an institution in a way that is unseemly for what a judicial body is supposed to be. Now, part of the view of the court that um, is reflected there comes, I think, from the confirmation process which has become much more visible in recent decades than was true historically, partly because of television and the internet and, and the like. Um, but the politicization of the process is evident in the following bit of data. Um, if you think of a Supreme Court justice being nominated, about whom there's a general view of three characteristics being present, that the nominee is qualified in terms of experience and, and general competence, that the nominee is reasonably moderate in his or her ideological views, um, not out of the mainstream, as we say, at, at either margin, um, and is replacing another justice of a more or less similar ideology. So there's no significant change in the makeup or the balance of the court if this individual is confirmed. Over the last 75 years, in such cases, there have been an average of only three negative votes in the Senate against confirmation of such justices. In the Kagan and Sotomayor confirmations, both of whom fit all three of those characteristics, there was an average of 37 negative votes. Um, and that is just an interesting measure of how political the process of nomination confirmation um, has become and how that's clearly affected the public's perception of the court. But in fact, it's not just the confirmation process. Um, a much deeper problem is that the, the perception of the court as a highly polarized and politicized institution today is accurate. Um, so a little while ago, I asked um, a number of my colleagues, both liberals and conservatives, um, without telling them why I was asking, uh, to give me a list of what they thought were the most important Supreme Court dis constitutional decisions since the year 2000. And I got a lot of different answers from people, and I, I put together the list of the 20 that received the most votes. And they range across a, a, a total array of constitutional law. They involve um, uh, gay rights and abortion rights and, and gun rights and, and the, the rights of criminal defendants and cruel and unusual punishment and search and seizure and equal protection and so on and so forth. Um, and what was interesting in, in those cases is that um, if you divide the justices into three groups, and I did this on the basis of, of research that's been done by two of my colleagues, Dick Posner and Bill Landis, both of whom were very conservative, uh, but very good empirical uh, analysts. Uh, and they looked at all the justices who served on the Supreme Court over the last 75 years and tried to characterize their ideology. Um, what they found is the four most conservative justices to have served on the Supreme Court in the last 75 years are currently sitting on the Supreme Court. <laughs> Scalia, Thomas, Roberts, and Alito and that the sixth most conservative justice to serve on the Supreme Court in those 75 years is also serving on the Supreme Court today, Justice Kennedy. Number five, by the way, was Chief Justice Rehnquist. Um, of the, of the, the four current so-called liberal justices on the court today, 
uh, Kagan, Sotomayor, Breyer, and Ginsburg. Um, uh, Posner and, and uh, Landis uh, rated them moderate liberals. That is, they were a far cry from true liberals like uh, Earl Warren or William Brennan or Thurgood Marshall or um, Abe Fortas or, or Arthur Goldberg, um, who were far to the left in terms of these criteria. Um, and, and the two justices who have served on the court in the last 12 years who don't fit into those two categories are Justices Kennedy and um, O'Connor. They're not among the four most uh, extreme conservative. And they are, are evaluated as quite conservative, but not nearly as extreme as the other four. OK, so that gives you a little layout of the court. So how did they vote in these 20 cases? Well, it turns out that of the four most conservative justices, they voted together 99% of the time. The only departure was just Chief Justice Roberts' vote in the Affordable Care Act case, um, in the 20 cases. The more liberal justices voted together 96% of the time. The two exceptions were Justice Stevens, who voted um, with the conservative justices in two of the 20 cases. Um, and Justices Kennedy and O'Connor uh, voted with the conservative 67% of the time. But the key thing is, if one, if one is concerned about polarization and politicization, that's about as dramatic an example of, of those characteristics as you can imagine. There's virtually no common ground in the justices' understandings of what the Constitution means, how to interpret it, um, and what results are appropriate. So it's no wonder that members of the public who don't have these data but have some intuition about all this are disillusioned. Now, I want to go beyond that and talk a little bit about um, how justices do or should approach their responsibilities. What explains this um, divergence between the different types of justices? Um, and is there a better and worse way of thinking about uh, how the justices fulfill their responsibilities? Because I think part of the reason citizens should be upset about the court, which they don't even know about, is that it's worse than they know which is that the reasons why the justices vote the way they do is deeply problematic. So to get at that point, let me, let me say that the, the, the central fulcrum of constitutional law is whether in any given case a justice should be judicially activist or judicially restrained in approaching the constitutionality of a law. That's overly simple, but as a, as a basic matter, Somebody says this law is unconstitutional. A judge has to decide in the first instance, am I going to give the benefit of the doubt to the legislature that passed the law and therefore bend over backwards to defer to the constitutionality unless it's obviously an unconstitutional law? Or am I going to say, no, for some good reason, I am not going to give the benefit of the doubt to the elected branches of government. I'm independently going to make my own rigorous determination as to whether this law is sufficiently justified to pass constitutional muster. That's judicial activism. OK, so in, in trying to figure out whether in any given case a judge should take a more activist or a more restrained approach, um, the, there are several different approaches to that question that judges have taken over the last oh, 50 years. Um, one of them is an approach of pure deference. That is, the notion is that we live in a democracy. The elected branches should be able to do what they want to do. The majority uh, should have its way. Court should intervene as little as possible because the courts are not majoritarian democratic. Um, and therefore, unless there's no rational justification for a law, um, the court should uphold it. That's, that's the most extreme version of judicial restraint. Uh, no justice on the current Supreme Court comes even close to adopting that position. Nor, by the way, should they. It's not, in fact, a principled or a, a, an acceptable position. Um, a second approach is what we've come recently to think of as originalism. And uh, originalism basically says, well, we can't be restrained all the time. To be restrained all the time is to abdicate our constitutional responsibilities as a court. But we don't trust judges to be able to play fast and loose with when they will be activists and when they'll be restrained. So basically, they should be restrained except in those circumstances when it's clear that those who adopted any particular constitutional provision intended or expected that law that's being challenged to be unconstitutional. So the idea of originalism is a judge puts himself or herself in the shoes of the framers of any particular provision and simply very narrowly ask, would they have wanted this law to be unconstitutional? If so, it's unconstitutional. If not, I defer to the legislature, and it's permissible. 
And that approach has a certain superficial appeal, but it is in fact deeply flawed because the truth is most of the time we have no idea what the framers thought about any particular question. And what most judges do when they purport to be doing originalism is basically to be, to be saying, well, let's see, the, the framers were reasonable people. I'm a reasonable people. <laughs> what would I have intended had I been a framer? That must be what the framers intended. And therefore, I'm going to do whatever it is the framers wanted. <laughs> and the proof of this, by the way, is if you look at decisions in which justices purport to be applying originalism, what you find is this. If I gave you the case and told you the name of the judge, you would be able to predict the outcome 90% of the time without knowing anything about the originalism. So that, in fact, the judges are acting on something other than the purported inquiry into originalism. The third approach that's existed over time um, it was, was first articulated in the Supreme Court um, 75 years ago in a footnote. Um, in a case called Caroline Products, and it basically said, okay, we have to strike a balance between this restraint on the one hand and the need to fulfill our responsibilities, which we do by being more aggressive on the other, and saying in effect that we should be more s skeptical about the constitutionality of laws when there is reason to distrust the majoritarian process, when the reason to give the benefit of the doubt to the democracy is called into question, then, and especially then, courts need to fulfill their responsibility to enforce the Constitution more actively. And in that footnote, the court identified two circumstances where that was true. One was when a law disadvantaged a group that historically had been disadvantaged in ways that seemed oppressive, subordinating, caste-like, uh, unsympathetic, uh, and degrading. In those circumstances, there was very good reason to have doubt about whether the legislature, whether the majority was behaving in a way that deserved deference. And the second situation were those cases in which there was reason to fear capture. That is one of the great dangers of democracy is at any given point in time, a faction that controls the government can make laws that will assure its perpetuation in power. And then they will manipulate the process so as to ensure that they get reelected repeatedly. And there, too, there's no internal check on that. Courts need to step in from outside and to aggressively examine laws that have that effect to make sure that that's not what's really going on. So the court in 1938 said those are the two circumstances where the distrust of the majority is greatest. And the courts need to be most activist in second guessing the legislature on the constitutionality of legislation. And that's the approach, I think, by the way, that makes the most sense. And that was the approach, I should add, that the Warren Court basically followed. If you go back and look at all the decisions of the Warren Court and lay them out in front of you and put them in two piles, those cases in which the court acted with restraint and those cases in which the court acted with activism, what you'll find is virtually every case that you would characterize as activist fits into one of those two buckets. It's either a case in which the law disadvantages a group that has historically been given the short end of the stick in the majoritarian political process, or it's a case in which the risk of capture is significant. This covers cases like Brown and Board of Education, or cases involving one person, one vote, or just generally protection of the right to vote, or, or protecting the rights of political dissenters or religious minorities or individuals accused of crime, and so on. Okay, now you've got the current majority of the Supreme Court. We're basically four very conservative justices and one conservative justice. And what I say is do the same thing. Look at all the decisions, say, since 2000, that they, on which they voted, and put them into two piles, the ones in which they've been restrained and the ones in which they've been activists. And tell me what you come out with, right? Work backwards. Don't ask what, what philosophy they say they're using. Work backwards from results and infer philosophy. And I've asked several of my very conservative friends to do this and come back to me with an explanation of the pattern that they get, and they never do. <laughs> and they never knew for, for a good reason. In the restrained category, you get cases where African Americans, women, gays, Hispanics, persons accused of crime are challenging the constitutionality of laws, political minorities, religious minorities, that always lose, virtually without exception. If you look at the, the, the bucket that includes the cases where the, this particular group of justices is activist, what you get is 
laws, decisions striking down laws prohibiting corporations from spending unlimited amounts of money in the political process, laws regulating guns, um, laws regulating the, the, the commercial advertising by corporations, um, affirmative action is unconstitutional. Um, so what you see is basically this court's decisions suggest a concern with corporations, with the wealthy, with gun owners, with, with whites, um, none of whom need the protection of the judiciary in our political process. Um, this is a majority that operates very largely out of their own personal political and, and, um, and, 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 and personal values about our society. Now, happily, the public doesn't really understand this. And if they did, that number would go from 33% to 6%, and should. But it's a serious problem for the future of our democracy. Thank you.